So good evening. Uh, I'm Tim O'Shea. I'm the pr principal of the University of Edinburgh, and it's a, a tremendous uh, pleasure to welcome you uh, to this fourth uh, in our series of uh, medical uh, detective lectures. Uh, I'm particularly pleased uh, to welcome school uh, students, and I hope some of you are thinking about becoming doctors or becoming vets or becoming university principals. And, um, and this is a, your opportunity to, to see, see how these different jobs are done. Uh, but also, uh, very pleased to welcome uh, members of the general public. Um, <clears throat> you, you're in a special place. Uh, University of Edinburgh, of course, is associated with medical detectives. Uh, because Sherlock Holmes was uh, modelled directly on a professor of forensic science who stood here. Uh, Professor Joseph Bell and one of the students in the audience would have been Arthur Conan Doyle, who would have sat where one of you, or maybe where, where numbers of you, are, are sitting. So, you know, so you're, you're, so you're in, a, in the space that generated the world's most famous medical detective, uh, and I'm uh, really very pleased that Assistant uh, Principal Professor Dorothy Crawford, who's some, hiding there, uh, had. Uh, it's a wonderful idea, and this, this is. Um, the first three lectures have been very successful. I know the last one uh, will be very successful too. Um, I was absolutely delighted when we recruited uh, Professor uh, David Argyle. Um, he was trained as a vet uh, in Glasgow, worked as a vet, uh, did his uh, PhD there, uh, then sent, spent some time in the United States um, as the head of veterinary oncology and gene therapy at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, we were very pleased when he joined us in 2005 as William Dick, uh, Professor of Veterinary Medical Studies. Um, and uh, he has chosen a topic that fits in very neatly with Sherlock Holmes and the Hound of the Baskervilles. Uh, his topic tonight is entitled, Hounds and the Cancer Genes, Cats and Dogs, Providing Clues to Treating Human Cancer. Uh, so please welcome Professor Argyle. Thank, uh, thank you very much, Principal, for uh, the welcome and the very kind uh, words. It's quite daunting to be in this lecture theatre, and I have to say the height of the lecture theatre is playing havoc with my very focal, so I may <laughs> pass out uh, during the lecture today. Um, I'd like to welcome all the school children uh, from the high school, who uh, some of you perhaps thinking of being uh, veterinary surgeons, and I thought, uh, well, somebody said to me, you probably should uh, say to the students something about getting into veterinary school, because, you know, it's quite daunting, 16 applicants for every uh, place at veterinary school, and as a high school student, that, that can be quite... Um, quite a task or a, a hill to climb. And <clears throat> the only words of advice I can give you is that I was in a similar situation uh, to you uh, 25 years ago, and uh, my father gave me some very, very sound advice um, as a teenager. He said, well, he said, you need to work really, really hard and get the grades. And he gave me an incentive. He said, if you don't get your grades, you'll drop your grades, and you'll have to read medicine. <laughs> and... <clears throat> And he said, you really don't want to bring that kind of shame on the family. <laughs> <clears throat> so, managed to get through uh, veterinary school, and uh, here I am tonight in, in one of the most famous lecture theatres in, in the university. So anybody, if I can do it, anybody can do it. So this is the uh, fourth and final lecture in a series of uh, lectures, really looking at scientific methodology to unravel uh, the complexities of uh, human and animal diseases. And in essence, uh, from the previous three speakers, they've really focused on um, scientific method and looking at human diseases. And mine has a slight twist to it in that I'm going to talk about veterinary diseases tonight. I'm going to talk about uh, diseases of companion animals and how they can uh, inform uh, the, uh, the, our understanding of human disease. So um, if you've come to the wrong lecture, now's the time uh, to leave. Now... As uh, the principal said, and, and stole my thunder really, the, uh, the medical school is very famous for a number of individuals who uh, essentially uh, made this medical school what it is today. We have Alexander Munro, Lister, and Simpson. And also we have uh, uh, here, we've got James Bell and uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and it's considered that 
uh, Joseph Bell was the inspiration uh, for Sherlock Holmes. What you probably uh, don't realise is that during a similar period in the 19th century, Scotland was also very famous for advances in, in veterinary medicine. And the rather uh, formidable character here, uh, who went by the unfortunate name of, of William Dick, was the founder of the, um, uh, the current veterinary school in, in Edinburgh. And Dick went to, uh, attended some anatomy lectures here in Edinburgh, and then went south to London to learn how to be a, a veterinarian. At that time at the Royal Veterinary College, I think that the course was around five weeks long. I think at the Royal Veterinary College now the course is around 12 weeks. Um, <laughs> But he came back to Edinburgh then and he established what is known today as the Royal Dick School of, of Veterinary Studies. Uh, the other chap uh, that I have to mention on the, uh, on the right here, uh, well on my right anyway, is, is uh, James McCall. And James McCall was a student of William Dick and was a great friend of William Dick and practised in Ayrshire uh, in, in Scotland. And they fell out. They fell out over a particular disease called Rinderpest, which is cattle plague, which was ravaging uh, Northern Europe at the time and certainly ravaging uh, uh, Britain. And uh, Dick felt that to get rid of Rinderpest, what you had to do, you had to treat cattle. You had to identify uh, um, the disease and you had to treat them and you could eradicate the disease that way. Uh, McCall thought that that was wrong. What you had to do was identify the disease and cull all the affected animals. And of course, McCall... Uh, was absolutely correct and Dick was completely wrong, uh, as we know today with our culling policy with, with foot and mouth disease. But uh, McCall, to separate himself from William Dick, set up the Glasgow Veterinary School on the other side of the country. And so there was a great rivalry uh, between Glasgow and Edinburgh. And thankfully that rivalry uh, doesn't exist uh, at all uh, today. <laughs> So, uh, what I uh, want to do now is bring you back up to date, and uh, I want to, uh, I, I'm not sure whether many of you know this, but the veterinary school actually sits within the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine, and uh, that's, I'd like to think, uh, perhaps the head of college would disagree with me, but I think that is a, a strategic decision uh, to have that, uh, because I think veterinary medicine and human medicine can converge, and by uh, looking at diseases that occur in both species, we can actually unravel the complexities and advance science a lot faster. So I'm going to take you on a, a bit of a journey now, talking about what we've learned from animals so far, because we have a lot of history with that. Um, I'm going to use the subject of cancer, because that's what I know about, uh, and uh, I'm going to show you how we're trying to unravel the complexity of, of cancer and how that can be pushed into human medicine. And then I'm going to bring you right back at the end and, and really sell you a role for comparative medicine as, as a major way forward. So this slide... Um, <clears throat> we often talk about um, ourselves looking like our, our pets, some more than others. Um, <clears throat> And that's absolutely uh, correct in some circumstances. But what we know now, because we have uh, the human genome, which was rapidly followed by uh, the canine genome, we know in actual fact that um, not only do we phenotypically look like our pets, but at a genotypic level as well, we're also very similar. So, for instance, this lady down here with a rather um, uh, uh, rowan hair colour, the gene for this hair colour is exactly the same for this Springer Spaniel uh, here. Um, I can't really say much about this chap here. <laughs> now, this is a quote from uh, medicine, which is, as comparative medicine is the medicine of the future, and sooner it is realized, the better for man uh, and beast. And just to uh, put that into perspective, that was a quote from 1896, uh, and so there were some progressive people even uh, 113 years ago. Now, I told you I was going to talk about uh, cancer tonight, but just to, uh, I'm just going to deviate slightly into cardiology, which I don't usually do. It's against my religion. Um, but I, I, what I want you to do, I want to give you an example of where um, something that's happened in, in, in dogs has had a major, major impact in human medicine. And the observant cardiologists amongst you would, um, will realise that this uh, um, picture here is, um, is a procedure called balloon, balloon valvuloplasty, and it's used to treat uh, a congenital condition in children uh, called pulmonic stenosis. And uh, 
back in the late 70s, uh, this was, um, uh, you know, this procedure wasn't um, uh, developed. There was a group at John Hopkins which were developing this, and they developed a dog model, an experimental dog model of pulmonic stenosis. And uh, it was quite successful, but it was a model. It was an induced system. And uh, they wanted to move this procedure into children. And the Board of Regents at the time at John Hopkins and the Ethical Board said that they couldn't allow that. They didn't want to do it. There wasn't enough evidence, and you needed to do this in a natural model. So they set up a collaboration with the University of Pennsylvania, and they agreed that the first dog to go through the cardiology unit with pulmonic stenosis in Pennsylvania would get the uh, treatment at, at John Hopkins University. And this is a condition of, of, of bulldogs. So lo and behold, this bulldog, uh, which came in unsuspecting to the University of Pennsylvania, was flown to John Hopkins and had the first uh, balloon valvuloplasty in 1980. And uh, that was an incredibly successful procedure. Thank God it was successful because that meant that that procedure was accepted and it went into clinical practice. And today, 25,000 procedures uh, worldwide per year of this, um, of this kind uh, occur. Now, what they uh, didn't realize, of course, uh, at that time was um, all subsequent bulldogs that went through pr this procedure died. Um, <clears throat> and that's because uh, what wasn't realized at that time, uh, bulldogs have an anomalous um, uh, left coronary artery. And if you use a bigger balloon, what you do, you rupture the artery and they bleed to death. So in actual fact, if that had happened on the first bulldog, medical history could be very different. Uh, but in actual fact, um, they were successful. God was on their side, and this procedure went into clinical practice. So there's a classic example there of where um, veterinary medicine uh, really supported uh, human medicine. So I want you to bring you back to cancer now and, uh, and, and have a think about the history of cancer biology and talk about what we've really learned from animals so far. And, and without animals and without natural diseases in animals, I think cancer biology would be far behind what it is today. And again, just to introduce two people, one is, is uh, Peyton Roos here, who was the first man to describe avian leukosis. And uh, this man here I had the good fortune to work with when I was in Glasgow is Bill Jarrett. And Bill Jarrett was professor of pathology, veterinary pathology at the University of Glasgow. And uh, Bill Jarrett uh, discovered feline leukemia virus, and he noticed that there were lots of cats coming through the post-mortem room with thymic lymphoma, multicentric lymphoma. This is quite a bad disease of cats. In fact, when I was at Glasgow as an undergraduate, we basically learned that there were two diseases of cats. One of them was feline leukemia virus, and the other one wasn't. And that's all you learned when you were at Glasgow. And it was written into your contract, you had to work on feline retroviruses. And these tumours in these animals are caused by viruses. Uh, this is uh, RSV and this is feline leukemia virus. And by understanding how these viruses infect cells and they cause cancer, we've been able to identify um, the mechanisms by which uh, normal cells can become cancer cells by so-called disruption of the cancer genes or oncogenes. So we've learned a lot about normal cell proliferation and how that's disrupted by the viruses. And this has had a direct impact on, uh, on cancer medicine. And equally, and I just put up another th three characters from, from Glasgow. One is Bill Jarrett again. Max Murray was my head of medicine at the time. And uh, this character, uh, David Onion, seen uh, not for the first time with a bird on his arm, um, who, uh, <coughs> who was my PhD supervisor. And these guys were real uh, visionaries because they saw the benefits of comparative medicine. And uh, I'd just like to say that the work that these people did... Um, uh, this, this was incredible. Bill Jarrett noticed that cattle grazing on bracken up in the hills in Scotland. By the way, these are highland cows. Some people say they're for beef. They're essentially for tourists. Um, okay, but these are uh, 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 beef cattle grazing on the hills of, of, of uh, the west of Scotland. And they, if they uh, eat bracken, and they're also co-infected, I'm pointing at the screen there, you can't see that, with papillomavirus, um, then what happens is that they can develop all sorts of malignancies that go from the oral cavity right to the other end, which I'm too polite to say at this evening. Uh, but they develop tumours. And this was the first indication, of course, that papillomavirus was causing a malignancy. And this work directly, and I mean directly, really led to our uh, greater understanding of how these uh, viruses cause cervical cancer in women. And this work, again, directly led to um, the cervical cancer vaccine that we have for uh, teenage girls uh, uh, today. So we've learned a lot from uh, animals. 
So I want to bring you a little bit more up to date now and uh, think about cancer as a disease and what the clinical and biological problems are and what the uh, challenges that we face uh, right now. So what is cancer? It's quite difficult to, um, to define what cancer is. It's essentially a group of cells whose proliferation is uncontrolled and under certain circumstances uh, can metastasize. And if I just explain that, the body is in balance, okay? We have uh, um, the cells within the body cooperate to promote survival and life expectancy of the organism. And essentially cell birth is, is balanced by cell death. But when that goes wrong, we can develop a tumour. So what happens in a cancer cell is those, those normal control mechanisms for keeping proliferation under control are broken down, and the cell becomes rogue, and we grow a lump. Now, metastasis, then, is often what kills patients because the tumour can seed off into other parts and cause organ failure, and that's called metastasis. So it's a, it's a bad disease. Now... For many years, we've believed a classical stochastic model of how cancer uh, develops. So if you bear with me, I'll try and make this uh, as painless as possible. But essentially, what we start off with is any cell in the body, and we get a change to the DNA in that cell. And that could be because, you know, you're having a crafty smoke in the bike shed, and that's a carcinogen, so you could develop a mutation in your, one of your cells. Uh, unfortunately, then what happens is that you've got that mutation but you're also a crafty drinker as well, and then you do other things that cause cancer, and uh, essentially what uh, you do, you accumulate a series of mutational events which lead you to produce a malignant cell. So we think there's linear progression, accumulation of mutations, and eventually you get a large tumour which has the ability to metastasize. And uh, just to put that into clinical uh, perspective, this is the generation of, of colon cancer. So what we have is the beginnings of a, a, a benign adenomatous uh, polyp here, and then the accumulation of mutational events, which finally lead you to a large tumor which can obstruct the bowel and in, invade all the mucosa here, and eventually spread to other parts of the body, and that's what can uh, kill a patient. And if we look at the clinical disease in, I'm sorry to show you this before your tea tonight, but if we look at the clinical disease in people and we look at the clinical disease in, in animals, there are a lot of similarities. So this is head and neck uh, cancer, a primary tumor, head and neck cancer in man. Of course, we have head and neck cancer in, in the cat here. We can have spread of that tumor to the thoracic cavity. This is in, in man. We look at the thorax slightly differently in dogs and cats. We put them on their side. So this is a side view of the thorax, and this is metastasis. These are these cannonballs here. These are the metastasis here in the lungs of a human. And then sometimes we have disseminated tumors that affect the blood system. So this is Hodgkin's disease in, in uh, non-Hodgkin, sorry, lymphoma in people, and this is non-Hodgkin uh, lymphoma in the dog. So we have similarities at the, uh, at the clinical uh, level. Also, we have a similar similarity in dogs in terms of the incidence of disease. So this is um, data from the Morris Animal Foundation that shows that uh, this is the top 10 causes of death in dogs and the top 10 causes of death in cats. And you can see cancer is right out there, way, way in front of heart disease and way in front of kidney disease. And I always tell my cardiology colleagues, uh, if, uh, if, if the heart was so important, God would have given us two of them. Um, so cancer is the most important disease that we, uh, that we have to deal with in, in our domestic animals. And if you look at that in terms of figures, one in three dogs get cancer, one in three people get cancer. And if you consider there are seven and a half million dogs in the United Kingdom, then you can see how many cases that we potentially uh, have to deal with as, as practitioners. And as I said to you before, then we have these similarities, uh, not only at the phenotypic level, but at the genotypic level um, as well. Now, hopefully some of you will realize that this is not a kennel club breed standard for the Doberman Pinscher. Um, this is actually an abnormality. It's got a large uh, mass on there. So the biological problems that we deal with in clinical practice are very similar to people. We can often treat the primary tumor, but patients often die from metastatic disease. And also our conventional treatments, and I'm not talking about the new biologicals, but the chemotherapy drugs and radiation that we use are often very nonspecific and carry a high risk of toxicity. So for instance, here 
We can cause nausea and vomiting. I don't usually like putting a dog vomiting there. This is the kind of thing I used. When we lived in America, Halloween was a big thing, and I didn't really like children coming round to the house. So uh, I used to put this on the step. It was considered a rather British eccentric while we were out there. And um, chemotherapy in dogs and cats, we use at slightly different doses. We very rarely get hair loss, except for at the, in people you see hair loss with chemotherapy in dogs. You don't tend to see that unless they're the, things like these, uh, which are you know, curly-coated breezes. This is a poodle, obviously. And I remember this case uh, distinctively because um, uh, this was when I was in, in, in the States. This poodle had driven all the way up, not on its own because it couldn't drive, <laughs> but um, with its owners from the deep south. Uh, they were slightly right of Genghis Khan. Um, they were carrying a shotgun. Um, they were, uh, the dog was called George Bush. Um, and if anybody is old enough to, to remember this, the, the consultation was a little uh, not dissimilar from a scene from Deliverance. Um, and uh, unfortunately, when I started treating this dog, I turned this into this. Um, and uh, probably the closest I've ever come to, to losing kneecaps. Anyway... So it can carry the side effects of, of treatment. However, today, you know, I, I've explained to you how the dog can uh, potentially be a model for human disease. What we have today, though, are very good defined rodent models of cancer. And uh, in fact, the mouse has taken over as a model for uh, cancer in, in many instances. And that's because we're able to manipulate the mouse genome and make very good what we call transgenic mouses, which are cost-effective, efficient, and we can, we can make uh, 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 mouse models which have specific gene knockouts, and we can look how a cancer develops. So they're very important tools for cancer discovery. Where they fall down is that the, uh, if you start looking at treatment models in mice, so you start using the mouse to look at how to treat cancer, the treatment models rarely translate into clinical practice. Essentially, my mum could cure cancer in a mouse if she tried. Um, uh, but... Um, the problem is, is that translation then to human uh, medicine very rarely uh, uh, goes into practice. And so what we have is an information gap between preclinical models and phase one human clinical trials. And, it's and what I'm going to do at the end is bring you back to see how we can fill that gap. So what I'm suggesting to you then, there are opportunities in veterinary medicine, I think, to include naturally occurring cancer models in the study of cancer biology and therapy. And I think what we can do now is, uh, I put up that rather funny slide with the pictures of dogs looking like uh, humans, and, uh, but we can go far beyond observation now, and we can back that up with hard genetic evidence because we have the publication of the canine genome. So there are a whole raft of reasons why companion animal cancer and human cancer can converge to try and unravel the mysteries for both species. Okay, so what I want to do now is to show you... Oh, oh, there we go. Spoiled the joke. Um, what I want you to do, uh, want to do now is just show you what we're doing in Edinburgh to try and uh, do that actual unravelling. And uh, some of my group are in the audience tonight. I'm not sure why you're not working. It's <laughs> still, still before seven. Um, but anyway, thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> So what we have is a comparative oncology research group. We're very interested in the molecular basis of disease and really trying to understand the biology to identify therapeutic targets and identify markers of disease and eventually translate that into, into practice. So what I'd like to do is uh, show you what we're trying to do by introducing you to some of our, our patients. Um, uh, this is Jake. Oh, sorry, uh, client confidentiality. Um, <laughs> This is uh, Jake, the Labrador Retriever, and again, not a breed standard. Um, this dog is, is, is very lame here because it has a large um, tumour, and unfortunate for uh, Jake as well. What's happened with this tumour, it has spread to um, the thoracic cavity, so we have a lung metastasis, and Jake came to see us in, in the hospital there. And what we know is that Jake has a, a primary bone tumour called osteosarcoma, and osteosarcoma is also a very important tumour of uh, adolescence. Uh, so it's, a, it's a more of a childhood tumour and, and teenage tumour. And the observant, those of you who are still awake or gnawing your own leg off to keep awake, uh, will realise, if you look at this picture carefully, all of these dogs have three legs, because uh, this is my osteosarcoma clinic. We were running a trial at the time. So uh, what we have is, is dogs that develop the same um, sort of uh, disease. 
And this is a very uh, complicated diagram. I don't want you to worry about this um, too much. And this is work done by uh, Melissa Paoloni, who did a medical residency with me and then uh, went on to work at the NCI uh, in, in Bethesda on, on comparative medicine. And this essentially is a map of all the genes that are expressed in, in the cancer cells. Okay. And what she did, she took all of the genes that are expressed in the dog cancer cells and the human uh, cancer cells, and she looked at those genes on uh, what we call a microarray chip. And really the long and the short of it, although this looks quite complex, is if you map the genes of the dog tumor and the human tumor, there are virtually uh, very little differences. In fact, uh, they have the same uh, molecular uh, signatures. Now, if you look at the survival of children with uh, osteosarcoma, you can see that before the 1960s, where it was just surgery, the um, five-year survival was quite poor. The introduction of chemotherapy and then intensive chemotherapy has dra dramatically changed that. But what you see is still 80% survival at five years, so there is still 20% death. Um, uh, so it's still a very, very bad disease. We certainly haven't um, uh, gone any way to, to curing it outright. Uh, but what you see, if you put the dog, if you map the dog survival onto there, you can see the survival is incredibly poor. And a one-year survival with a dog with osteosarcoma, despite surgery and chemotherapy, I would call a success. But I'm easily pleased. Okay, so the problems then with this disease... Um, and the current therapies that we have is that despite aggressive uh, treatments, many cancers such as osteosarcoma are not cured. Relapse is often inevitable. And we have to question now in terms of how we're treating these patients. Are we treating the correct uh, population of, of cancer cells? And I'll try and make that a little bit clearer. Now, you'll remember a few slides ago I showed you this model of uh, how cancers develop, and I said to you that we had any cell in the body, and we, we caused a, a mutational event. There was an accumulation of mutations to finally get a tumor that could metastasize. And more recently, we've been questioning whether this is an appropriate model system. And just to describe to you why um, I think this might be different, I want to turn your attention to what happens in normal organ systems. And I'm sorry, I don't know whether this is projecting terribly well. But what you have in normal organ systems is, for instance, you know, it's been a difficult day for me. I had a clinic this morning, uh, very difficult clients. Um, I then had um, a rather difficult meeting and a difficult afternoon. And to be honest with you, by that time, you're ready for a drink to relax. And uh, you could have a drink to unwind, and you can get unwound as a newt. And eventually, what your liver has to do then is try and recover the cells that you have damaged by taking that alcohol in. And the liver is very good at doing that, and like many other organ systems, because it has uh, stem cells in it. And these stem cells are very clever cells because they can give rise to themselves, or they can give rise to progenitor cells and terminally differentiated cells, which are the cells that do all the work in the liver. So what the, the tissues in the body have is a normal hierarchical structure, and uh, it's a very clever, well-organized system. And we've been asking ourselves, well, perhaps do tumors have a, a hierarchical uh, system as well? And in actual fact, is it that tumors don't arise in every cell in the body or can arise in every cell in the body? Do they arise in the stem cell and give rise to an actual hierarchical system within the tumor? And you can say, well, why are you telling us that? It's completely irrelevant. Well, it's very relevant because if we have a tumor that's been, been created by a very, very small population of stem cells, these stem cells are notoriously resistant to things like radiation and chemotherapy. So if we treat a patient with radiation and chemotherapy, we drop down the bulk population is what we see clinically, but we're always going to leave some of these stem cells behind. And in fact, as I said, this is what we often see clinically. We see resolution of the tumor, but we see a recurrence. So we've been questioning then, should we be developing treatments that not only knock down this bulk population, the majority of the tumor, but also if it is truly hierarchical, we need to target the true uh, tumor stem cells. And just to illustrate that point, um, uh, I just want to uh, give you one analogy. I'm an incredibly lazy gardener. And when uh, my wife says to me, will you please go out and do something about the weeds in the back garden, I usually go for the largest thing I can find in the garage and uh, basically uh, go over the top 
and, and cut off, and nobody can see what's, uh, that, uh, that I've done that. But what, of course, I've done is left the root behind. So essentially what we're doing with cancer is that uh, are we using the chemotherapy and the radiation, the biggest tools in the box, to knock down that uh, tumour population? But what we're leaving behind is this root cause of the malignancy. So our hypothesis was essentially cats and cancer in cats and dogs is potentially a stem cell disease. And what we've done is try to go around now trying to find out whether this is actually um, true. So we go back to our patient then that I showed you, uh, Jake, with the osteosarcoma. And we've developed a whole series of techniques. And I know that my PhD, Talia Blacking, is in the audience. And, and I'm describing three years of her PhD here in one slide. And I'm sorry that's... Uh, <laughs> You'll be able to come off the medication eventually, don't worry. Um, and we've developed uh, techniques to be able to um, identify uh, these stem cells within normal tumour biopsy samples. And what we do, we take a biopsy sample and uh, we put it into these growth conditions that we've developed, very harsh growth conditions, where normal cells or normal cancer cells won't grow. And we grow these uh, spheroid, uh, what we believe are the putative stem cells. And lo and behold, when we try and differentiate them, we can recapitulate uh, the tumour in, in culture. And if we take a closer um, uh, look at these things, what we can see is this is the using a fluorescent expression marker, and we can show that these cells, these clusters of cells, express markers indicative of a stem cell phenotype. Okay, so we know that. And the other thing that's important about these tumours is that these cells is that they're highly resistant to the effects of radiation over a clinical dose range. And if we actually look at their uh, DNA damage response pathway. So we look at these cells. Cells have to uh, respond to DNA damage like um, uh, photons and electrons in radiotherapy. We can see, in, I'm not going to go into this in any great detail, but these pathways in these cells are, are very, very different, and they're uh, very different to the bulk population of uh, the normal tumour. And uh, we've extended that now to another uh, round of patients. This is Hamish. is a dog that's only five months old. And he presented with this condition to us, which is very bad. It's acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And we had to use a slightly different technique. We used something called flow cytometry sorting to sort his population of cells. And lo and behold, we can identify populations of cells within his um, uh, marrow and within his uh, blood picture, they are highly resistant to the kind of drugs that we would use um, to treat him. So we have this resistant uh, population. And again, extending this further out, uh, this is, um, as you'll probably know, is a boxer. Boxers are usually born with a brain tumour. It's a, it's a normal trait in the boxer. They're very uh, common. There's very little brain, uh, but a lot of tumour. And uh, again, we uh, took some of this tumour, we've demonstrated that um, they, we can identify these cells, these very primitive cells within the tumour that express embryonic stem cell markers. And these tumours are highly, res these cells within that population are highly resistant to the effects of radiation. And this again is incredibly important because radiation is what we use to treat this tumour. So whatever happens, if we use radiation, we're going to knock down the bulk population, but we're never going to hit uh, um, the uh, stem cell compartment. So we've taken a lot of these cells now and taken this a little bit of a step uh, forward and basically tried to um, use the technique that I showed you that Dr. Paoloni had used with taking these uh, populations and looking at some of the normal stem cell compartment, these are mesenchymal stem cells, and again looking at the whole range of gene signatures and the differences between these two populations. And from that we have uh, not a, uh, an unusual list of, of, uh, of potential suspects, if you like, which could be used to try and uh, therapeutically target these cells. And at the moment we're actively exploring at least three of these um, as potential therapeutic targets in, in these diseases. And again, we've extended this out to, to uh, breast cancer. This is inflammatory breast cancer in the dog. This is a dog on its back and, uh, here. And this is breast cancer in the cat. And uh, essentially, we think that breast cancer in the cat may be a reasonable model for human disease. And we've been looking at um, some of the um, uh, signaling pathways in breast cancer. And one thing that we think may be important now is that these primitive cells may borrow signaling pathways from normal stem cells, something we call epithelial to mesenchymal transition, to help them metastasize. And that's something that we have 
uh, one of our students currently uh, working on. So, what have we learned from animals? Potentially common tumour types may have their origins in, in potential rogue stem cells or tumour initiating cells, and these harbour resistance to things like chemotherapy and radiation. And we think that the molecular signatures in these um, uh, cells may provide clues to how we can break that resistance and prevent metastasis. And this slide always reminds me that there are always surprises in biology and also that we have a lot of hurdles uh, to overcome uh, before we can get this into the clinic. And essentially that's what we're trying to do. So the idea is that we take a natural disease, if you like, we look at target identification, perhaps translate that back into clinical practice but in parallel, perhaps in form, uh, human studies at the same time. And uh, when we set out to, uh, to do this, we also realised that we didn't let, know a, an awful lot about animal stem cells per se. And uh, as Edinburgh, as some of you may know, is probably the stem cell capital of the world. It has a fabulous uh, human stem cell programme and centre for regenerative medicine within the medical school, so uh, we have to capitalise on that. And we're very grateful for, to the uh, Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons Trust for having the faith in us to uh, develop a companion animal normal stem cell programme to look at these stem cells in disease, ageing and regeneration. And just in a couple of slides, I just want to mention that we have a, a programme looking at cardiac stem cells in the dog and the role of uh, cardiac stem cells in disease. This is run by my wife in association with Brendan Corcoran, who's in the audience. We have a student, Hannah Gear, working on this. And basically, they've been identifying, again, uh, normal stem, adult stem cells in the dog and trying to identify and uh, um, correlate that to a disease situation. And with our colleagues in, in Glasgow, looking at the role of mesenchymal stem cells to treat another disease that affects dogs and affects humans, which is osteoarthritis, which is something that comes to us all. And, uh, but it's very important in the veterinary species, the horse, the dog and the cat, and also uh, in, in humans. As an additional component to our stem cell program, we're also uh, uh, trying to identify ways which we can take uh, normal adult cells uh, from dogs and revert those back into a stem cell phenotype, so-called uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. And in fact, not only may this uh, help to um, uh, launch regenerative medicine in veterinary medicine, but also this could create a whole uh, range of in vitro uh, technologies that we can use to test drugs and try and reduce the number of animals in research. So I just want to try and draw some of these to, things to a close now and just try and uh, argue the case again for uh, comparative medicine. And I want to do that by showing you this slide, which I think is quite uh, revealing. This is a slide, it's a little out of date now, it's from 2002, but it's relevant today. And this shows the number of, um, of, of drugs going towards um, uh, cancer uh, treatments in, in human medicine. And what we have, the number of drugs... In, uh, in a preclinical development, the number of drugs being tested in preclinical development per year is around 800. Okay? The number of drugs that finally get to the marketplace, one to two per year. Okay? So you can see an enormous investment has to go into this procedure to actually uh, get one or two drugs out. Now put $800 million there with the financial crash now, that's probably billions. Um, but uh, essentially a lot of money. And you can see a lot of these drugs fail during phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials in people. And what we have in human medicine is a linear drug development pathway from preclinical models, usually in the mouse. And I said to you, a lot of these drugs fail in this translation from small animal right through to people in the phase one period. We lo lose a lot of drugs during that period. So what I'm suggesting to you, the fact that we know that cancer is an important disease in dogs, one in three get it, and we've got the genetic capabilities and the tools to look at this, could we superimpose then a parallel uh, drug program uh, using um, uh, companion animals. So essentially the dog could fit into a whole range of the sections of the linear drug development pathway and right from the preclinical setting where we could look at confirming the model relevance, the target biology, assay development, right through to phase three clinical studies where we can form human medicine about biomarkers, combination treatments and minimal residual disease. And in fact, this is one such program that was 
I was involved in in the States. And in addition to having this sort of program where we can look at a whole range of things, we can also use very sophisticated imaging technologies to confirm all of this. And just to be fancy, this is a PET scan. Uh, this is positron emission tomography, not the PET that you stroke. Um, and uh, this is where we put a radio label dye into patients. And this dog, for the, uh, for the observant amongst you, they're still awake. This dog has Hodgkin's disease, uh, has uh, large lymph nodes, uh, prescapular lymph nodes here. These are big and large lymph nodes. This here is just the bladder. It's where the radioactive isotope collects. And then this is an experimental drug. And you can see a week later, what we've done is, is we removed the tumor. We've got a bit in of collection in the gallbladder and the bladder, which we know, but uh, essentially we've got rid of the tumor. So we can use quite sophisticated imaging technologies to um, uh, look at these trials. And something that we're doing here in Edinburgh right now, we have a, a program with the College of Science and Engineering to develop these in vitro uh, in vivo microsystems. So College of Engineering have developed very small in vivo microsensors. And these microsensors uh, can pick up whole sort of changes, different changes, oxygen tension, etc., in tumors. And we can implant these into our patients. And what we're looking at is being able to use in our radiotherapy protocols to be able to train, change treatment in real time uh, just by the readouts that we get during real-time treatments, which is quite an advance. And again, we're using the dog as a model before it goes into uh, people and, and children. So I bring you back to comparative medicine. And comparative medicine is the medicine of the future. The sooner it is realized, the better for man and beast. And essentially, we are at a critical point in medical research where the similarities between human and veterinary diseases can go beyond observation and can be supported with hard genetic evidence. And it's not for me to say about this picture at all, uh, about the, uh, this is Sir John Savile, our head of college, and I'm sure he doesn't have a bulldog at all. And although I hope this talk has been very good, you've probably witnessed the end of rather promising career um, <laughs> by showing that slide. Uh, I'd like to end by thanking my research group who do all the work. It seems to be dominated by uh, women, mainly alpha women, uh, quite strong characters. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank all the people that fund uh, our work. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's should, we should all go home and have a drink now. Thank you. going to prove I'm an, as intelligent as that bulldog. <laughs> uh, well, you've saved me an introduction, but uh, it's great fun being head of the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine because of the friendly rivalry between vets and, and medics. And I have to say, David, that that was a quite brilliant talk for a vet. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but actually, it was also a brilliant talk for a doctor, so well done. Now, we, we do exchange a lot of information in the college, uh, as you can see, in research, but also in teaching. And we like to inculcate into our medical students very early in their career that they really have to have humility when they're dealing with patients. They have to realize that their patients are very often more intelligent and more sensitive than they are. And I think you've proved conclusively that the same... <laughs> The same mantra applies to canine medicine. Yeah, absolutely. David. They're absolutely. Probably sure. more intelligent, intelligent. and more yes, sensitive I know. than the rest. <laughs> but uh, I think you, your thesis is brilliantly proven, and of course, the interrelationships between human and veterinary medicine are, uh, in bulldog language, a no brainer, <laughs> aren't they? Uh, and it, it is fitting that the last talk in this very impressive series of lectures that Dorothy Crawford organized um, reminds us and links us back to the previous lecture where John Iredell was telling us what was important was the dog that didn't bark in the night. Mm -hmm. Well, tonight the dogs barked. Mm -hmm. So, David, uh, brilliant talk. Thank Thanks you very, very much. much again. Thank you. Thank you. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.